Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, today, with the opportunity of the completion of uh, Nicolina's residency here at Thinker Makerspace, uh, we have a series of talks with the title of uh, Waves, Body, and Disturbing Overtones. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have three keynote speakers. We will start with Nicolina, who will have a short walkthrough in the exhibition space where she will show uh, uh, the, her work, the process that she has followed and her final piece. Uh, Nicolina will be followed by the, uh, Mihalis Shammas, who will be presenting from um, Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, he will have an online talk where he will present his uh, piece led the making of Mirai. And then finally, we will conclude with our visitor, uh, Derek, who has been here with us already for two days uh, for uh, a, a very creative workshop and will also uh, present uh, his work. Thank you again for being here with us today. Maybe Nicolina, you want to say something? Uh -huh. Hey, thank you all for coming. I am Nicolina Stilianou, and I am the resident artist here for the past four and a half months. And, and the past, but not the, like my practice is based on performance, uh, sound and sculpture, and I try to find ways to combine the three um, by creating musical instruments that in order to activate their sounds, you need to activate the movement of, of your body. And like through that, I'm trying to find ways to communicate with the objects or like these body sculptures and the, um, the extension. So you also kind of uh, extend the way you sense your environment. Um, for like, for my residency here, I, I did a prototype of a new project called Inflated Liquidities, which is a working title. And my research, or like my exploration, I would say better, um, was to study the church organ pipe and the accordion, the bagpipe, and hydravlophon at some point. Um, I don't know, like I, I would prefer to kind of talk a little bit about this here, but then to, to walk around the space to talk more about the process and how I moved from one um, object to the other and how I created the prototype. Um, so this, like this instrument, is supposed to be a, an in, a wind-based instrument, where, like, in order to create the sound, like the performer wears this, like, um, wearable, like, um, let's say, inflatable or accordion-like uh, origami uh, sculpture, and through body movements and dance movements, you create the wind that is sent to the pipes in order to create the sounds. I will go more through that um, in a bit, uh, but what I am interested in this project is the synergy and the communication the performers built together in order to create the composition um, and how to kind of create the set for a playground to emerge and through that to create the compositions. And that's pretty much about it uh, in a, like as an introduction. Perhaps we go through the space um, to the exhibition and yeah, and we can continue there. Like I had this idea of this instrument like uh, in 2000, 21 at some point. So I began to write a text how I imagine these to behave or how I imagine 
uh, it reacting in my body or like how how is that connection? So I print like uh, Maria printed um, this text, which is yeah like a poem description. So like you can save it for to read it later or whenever you feel like. Um, so when I start, like uh, when I started my residency here, I began to go through a little bit of the, like um, the idea a bit more, and to try to find uh, what interests me uh, and why I'm interested in this uh, object and why I'm interested in like this relation with the body. And I came across Juliana Bruno's public intimacy book, which is um, like there is a chapter chapter on Rebecca Horn's uh, body sculptures and the um, and the relation she creates with the space and like and the book is based based on architecture, but I didn't spend time reading on that. I was more interested in in this relation. And so on the book, like um, Juliana Bruno was referring to the 19th century suspension um, ma machines or like the, um, the machines they were doing for physiotherapy and how, how the body becomes uh, part of the extension and how the body be, uh, like, um, becomes one with the extension. So you begin to sense with it and like for example she was referring to the basal dresses the victorian dresses where like the posture of women be began to change so they had to to sit differently and they had to kind of walk differently they have to they had to kind of think how they would walk through the door and so it really makes this um like it makes one to be aware of the body and what they're wearing. So I began to kind of uh, look a bit through through that and kind of, and try to also understand, okay, like how do I, um, how, yeah, how to, um, how, how do I understand how do I kind of, um, I want to develop um, these kind of ideas or like these um, structures they create because it's like uh, I think when someone sees my work like there is quite a straightforward reference to Rebecca's horns, Rebecca horns and like this body sculpture genealogy. Um, some artists in the 60s began to kind of explore and Yes, and then we had our first meeting with Stella and Kiriagi and Marios, and I was presenting. I will show, like, I will show you parts of my notebook, and then I will leave it on the table so you can flip it through because I have like either some sketches, either some notes, so you can really go through it. Um, so you can come perhaps a bit closer. So I, um, I began from like thinking about how, how the body is within a structure that kind of tries to activate these sounds through like pulling and pushing and like how, how to kind of create it. So I began to make this, let's say, very bit messy. You can, you can sense that I was still a bit like confused with how things worked. Um, so I began to sketch a little bit about it. And this was like, um, this be began to like mat be materialized when I started looking at the organ and how the organ works, which is like a very complex um, instrument because it has so many mechanisms and one um, like, 
one part of it interacts with the other and then it goes back to the other and then <laughs> so it, it's really it's really much about this communication between um uh, the player and the machine or like the instrument and so I, I was looking about like on books or like reading materials to read and I came across to this book which was like a treasure it's a book from uh, written by Mark Wicks and it's from the eight, uh, 19th century late 19th century and it pretty much explains how to build an organ, a pipe organ. So it has like these different chapters and, and you can also like flip through it to see how. Um, so I began to read it and I could pretty much didn't understand anything. <laughs> Either because um, I had to like learn how to translate uh, inches into millimeters or centimeters um, or either because there is a terminology of how the pipe organ is um, like, for example, like you can see here, let's say like this is uh, the pipe, where is the pipe? For example, here, so it has, it's, it's basically three parts that are connected. So each part has a different name. Um, so you have like here is the mouth and here is the lower lip, here is the upper lip and here is the language and this is length and so on. So I had to really memorize all this information before understanding what um, this book is saying. And like what like uh, what I was fascinating with at an early stage of creating uh, the pipes was how the sound is actually created. Um, so I think like at first I was like, hey, it's like a flute, come on, like how difficult it can be. But then when I actually tried to make the first prototypes, uh, it was quite difficult um, because in order to set the right parameters uh, to create, to make the air oscillate, it, it needs a, a bit of attention. So I began to go through like um, measurements and like um, to find the right moments to be a bit precise about um, yeah, this process of like how to you blow and then how the oscillate creates. And what basically happens, which I really enjoyed, is that when you blow and in order to create the resonance and make the air oscillates, the air needs to hit this upper lip. And then because of its elasticity and correct me if I'm wrong in my physics knowledge, when the air hits because of its elasticity, like it, it, it gets confused. So it goes out, in and out, but because, yeah, it, it needs to, it wants to go back to itself. So it creates a repetition. So the more you, you uh, apply like air, then it oscillates uh, because of this movement, like this repetition. So it goes uh, in and out all the time. Um, and that's how sound is created. And this was a very bad way of <laughs> naming it. I can perhaps when I'm a bit less stressed, I can explain it a little bit better in one one on one. Um, yes, so and then like where should I continue? I think when like we can perhaps come here where I have my first tests. And I began to go through the pipes. So I began to laser cut uh, with MDF boards and try to make wooden, wooden pipes and try to measure. So I put like some uh, marks here because um, 
like I could not really find it by my ear, so I, I needed to mark and then just work through, like, by the way, you can really use the objects if you would like to and try and see. And basically what happens is that the materiality of the flute um, gives the timbre of your sound. For example, like a wooden uh, pipe would sound more like a flute and then like, um, like a brass, brass or like a metallic one would sound like a trumpet or a saxophone and so on. And then uh, depending on the length and the diameter of the pipe, then you get lower notes and you get the tone of, uh, of each pipe. And at the beginning, I really wanted to work with stainless steel because I really liked uh, the vibrations it does as a material. I don't know if you have like these uh, kitchen sinks and they like, when you like hit them, they make really, these really beautiful sounds. And at some point I was interested to kind of combine it with water because um, like with the movement, you can shift the frequency. So I was like, oh yes, let, I, could, I could work with that. So I begin to, I, I took a copper sheet and we made with uh, Marios, Mar helped me to make a, a negative on one of the machines in the workshop to have it as a mold and to hammer the, the stainless steel on, on it. So it will take the cone shape and And then I realized that like stainless steel is so hard to actually bend. Like I, of course, everyone was telling me, oh, it's the hardest material to work. Like in the materials of, um, you have available and so and like you should find something more easy. But I was, I was, no, 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 I will work with it. And when I actually managed to bend this, it had like these scratches and these like hammers, hammers. So it was like, I don't really want, want this. On, on my instrument. So I, be, I began to, to look for industrial um, companies that could bend uh, this sheet uh, for, like, for, for me so I could have like really beautiful shape. And it was really hard to find at some point because like the industry inside, like we don't have um, a pipe, um, pipe organ in industry in Cyprus. So there's not really someone I could go and reach to and be like, you know, I would like to do this by myself. And, and like they could help me in terms of like machines. Um, and the industry in Cyprus like works in a very specific measurement. So, like um, if I wanted, for example, to do a huge pipe, they could help me. But if I wanted to do like pipes this size or measurement this size was not really an option. Um, and I think that's, that's when it was the moment where I said, okay, I need to change material. I need to find other ways to work with it and kind of help myself. Uh, through the process. So um, I moved on into like copper, she, uh, sheet of copper. And I actually loved working with copper. And I continued making like negatives uh, to fit each, each note and each, um, yeah, each note for, for the, the octave I wanted to work with. And I worked analogically, so I um, didn't have to make molds, a lot, um, a lot molds. Um, yes, there are different ways to make and depends on like the, 
like there are different techniques to make pipes. For example, there is a flue pipe, which is like the kind I made, and there is the reed pipe, pipe which the accordion uh, uses that I will go through in a little bit. And, and later on, like these were also some plastic tests. These were the, like the first tests I made to actually find the moment where the sound is created. And then my, my dad is, uh, mil like works in the military. And I was like, uh, dad, I'm looking for like bronze and like meta, like pipe type of things. Like, do you have any shells? And so he brought me some shells that are unusable. And they actually made sound without, without even trying to. So it's like, <laughs> they actually make really good sound. And this, for example, is created because when you fire the gun, then it just hits. So you already have the mouth ready there to make the sound oscillate. So at some point I was thinking to make um, more of this and kind of change their length, uh, but I didn't really proceed with that idea. Um, I think mostly because it would have um, very loaded contextual connotations and I didn't want to take that responsibility without delving into um, understanding why and how and what and so on and um, yeah so um i think for in terms of the pipes like when i did the first uh like copper test i tried to like uh, polish it and work through it and then i was like hmm, do i really like it that way i mean it it has so um I then proceeded to kind of just leave it rough and, and, and almost like just how, how it reacts with the materials um, I used to weld it and the fire blower and so on. It actually creates like really beautiful colors by itself. Um, so how should I? And perhaps then I could talk a little bit about the accordion. Yeah, I got the accordion. I bought it like in Finland a few years ago. And when I came here, I realized that, oh, it's such a shame I didn't bring it with me. Uh, so I, I asked like two friends of mine who were coming to Cyprus uh, to bring it. So they brought it in Cyprus. And I was like, OK, I will dismantle it just to get get the picture of how how it works and how um how the actions are created for example like you press the button and this is pulled so then the wind uh passes through to create the sound and this is um like the accordion works with reeds and it's pretty much the same logic as flu pipes the difference is that instead of um, the air oscillates and create like and the sound is created, it's like the reed which oscillates and uh, which like moves and the sound is created. Right, right. <laughs> um, so it's pretty much like I think. Everyone will be like um, aware of this, but. So it's pretty much like these reeds and then you have two notes, one above and one below. So that's why you get, uh, get the breadth, breadth of the sound. And then what I was really interested at some point was like the matrix, which, um, which is in, uh, similar to how um, a matrix of a pipe organ works. Um, of course, like pipe organ is more complex because it has like many combinations and like many ranks of pipes and it's like a very huge organ and it's, um, it works anyway. But like you have this matrix and then depending on like which button you press, 
then like there are, I don't know if you can see clearly, but then do you have like this uh, axis, like a uh, vertical axis that push uh, another, um, let's uh, horizontal axis. It press it so it's pulled and then like the back. So you have like it's pulled. So you, um, you let wind pass through the reeds and then the sound is created. And here you can create, for example, couplers. Uh, so you have different notes playing at the same time. And this, um, this um, like part of the accordion actually um, gave me a stimuli to how to proceed to the next phase of uh, this project if um, and when it will be realized, which is to make this like um, in a bigger scale, of course, like not cobbing that, but like kind of to try to think about it in a bigger scale and find ways for people to climb and create and create these activations. And Yes, and then like pretty much how the organ wor works is that you pull, so you suck air from outside and then you push, so you push the, the air back out. And this is happening with this. And which is actually uh, went uh, a step further in my uh, project here. And before going to the accordion, I actually began to practice it, practice or like try to understand a little bit silicon and inflatables with silicon. And, and I began uh, to, to look on soft robotic techniques. Of course, like it's a big word to say that I work, like I experiment with soft, soft robotics because it's not really the case, but I just took some like um, ideas of how to uh, let the air flow inside of silicon to create the inflatable. And I began here, like you can come closer. And I made some molds. And, and I began to blow, blow them. And as you can see, like some of them didn't work either because they were thin, either because I didn't glue them either uh, like uh, correctly or like my mix mixture was uh, not so precise. Um, either because my measurements were like uh, a bit um, uh, out and, and so on. Uh, but what I, what this uh, led me to was to begin to think uh, about larynx, larynx and how our voice is created because like it's basically muscles that come together or perhaps it was reeds. Like I think it was both reeds and, and silicon that led me to this, um, to this thought. So at some point I was thinking, oh, what if I do like uh, an, a, like a larynx type of thing with silicon, so that that triggers somehow the sound and so on. But I didn't proceed with that because there were so many things I I needed to um, to learn, and I didn't have enough time. Uh, to do so. So I, I just left that idea. Uh, but I continue to, to work a little bit with uh, silicon and try to see like what happens in a bigger scale of this and, and try to think. And then I did this object, which is pretty ugly. Um, and this was really heavy and also really unreliable because when you blow air, 
it's actually really beautiful because it takes a shape and you have like this like bubbles here and so on but then it it either breaks or it i it either like doesn't hold too much and then it doesn't really let the air out like the pressure was if I had to put pre apply pressure, then I would most probably just break it instead of send it to the pipes. Um, so that's when I thought, okay, I, I actually want, don't want to proceed with um, silicon at the moment, perhaps in the future if I have, um, but not now. And uh, and then it was about time to think a bit more like I, I was probably at the second half of my residency here so um, I had to really pro, pro, um, progress and find solutions instead of like being like oh do I want this or do I want that and and so on so I um, I began to sketch a few, I'll like take you a bit back here. And yeah, I began to, to have a bit sketches about like this, um, let's say body sculpture and how it could look and how it could behave. And you can see, you can go through this. There are like some like really rough sketches and and then um yeah like i began to kind of simplify instead of trying to make things more complicated so i was like okay what do i really understand about this object in terms of movement the accordion so then uh, how can I create something that can, I can easily make and like uh, relatively fast? So then I was like, okay, let's try to make something similar, like similar in movement. And so, and, and I began to, this was like one of the first tests and I did it to just test whether it sends some uh, like a signal to the pipe uh, or whether not, and then it worked. And I was like, okay, let's just proceed to make like uh, bigger ones, like um, with more movement so that the performers can actually um, have something to work on. And that's pretty much like how I proceed with this, like uh, two objects. Uh, that their, the performers would would wear, and perhaps like the last thing would be just to kind of uh, go through the the instrument and just um, like explain a bit more, and then I think like I'm done with the talk, and we can have a discussion or if you have questions to ask me about about this. Um, yeah, you can come closer. So, so what basically happens here is that um, like the performer triggers, like uh, kind of has this up and down movement and like perhaps this, this could be easier. No. And do I have any volunteer that would like to wear it? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> um, where would you like? Do you want it in your hand or? Whatever is useful. Like, it doesn't really matter. Ella, the never to mention us do this with this Victoriana do. Hello. 
Tot és dona, una sortida de Susana. Tot té l'is i part no hi ha un altre que no s'ha dit? No. Can't. Ne. So as you can see, it really needs like some physicality, which I really like to work in my uh, yeah in my practice. And of course, this is a prototype and it needs like some more configurations in order to work as uh, I would like it to, to work. But what it does, it's like, um, Teresa, right? Uh, as Teresa does, like she like um, opens and closes her um, hands. So air comes, like enters and then, um, and then like, she presses it and then through the tube, there is like a, a relatively simple mechanism inside that sends it to the sound box and through the sound box, it goes to the pipes. And basically like this, this uh, part here has like a snake type of movement because um, it helps the air spread a little bit and not go straight to the pipe because if it goes straight to the pipe, then you somehow like overtone it or like you create, um, you don't create the, let's say the right uh, tone. Um, and yes, I think- The one on that one would be a different tone, right? Completely different. Yes. The one that I was doing was that one, right? Uh, it's actually not not straightforward. Like these might trigger this node, or they might trigger like two nodes, and I have them written which is which. Um, but for example, like this, like this. But for example, this is two nodes. So it's like do and and like C and A note and then it's like this is goes here and but then i blow lot so it's like just yeah um it's still not tuned <laughs> and yeah like if you would like to try some um we can put some tape so you like or like you can like really not touch your mouth seam. And yeah, thank you very, very much for listening. Yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Michalis Shamas, and uh, I was gonna be there today, but unfortunately we couldn't make it. So we have to do uh, the lecture like this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, who I am. I am a designer and a sound artist uh, from Cyprus, but I live and work in The Hague in the Netherlands. I have a studio in a very nice place called the Instrument Inventors Initiative here in The Hague, which is a group of artists that focus on uh, mainly sound art and uh, media art. That doesn't really mean necessarily they invent instruments. However, that is uh, a big part of what I do, of my own practice. So again, very big part of what I do is I create uh, unique instruments for live sound performance. And it's very important to uh, stress that it's this is for uh, supposed to be for a live uh, act of sound. And today I'm gonna be uh, telling you the story of the instrument that you see behind me. I think it must be on my right on your screen. This instrument is called the Lirai, and this is a string instrument, but it works with electromagnetics. And I'm going to explain to you uh, how that works. But before we go into this project, 
I would like to show you a couple of other projects that, uh, well, let's say inevitably they led to the idea for this instrument to be created. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Um, can you see this? I can't hear you, but if you can yeah, see. Yeah, I see something that says video one. That means it's time to start with video number one. <laughs> oh, oh, that's for me. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You seem to have lost, there we go. One, two. Yeah, we don't see you, uh, but we uh, we hear you. All right, do you see my screen? I suppose you do or? Yeah. All right. So uh, what did we just uh, watch uh, right now? We just watched a project of mine called Kiklofonon that was made in 2015. And this was actually my graduation project for architecture school. So uh, I, as I mentioned before, I do call myself a designer and a sound artist, but actually my education is in architecture.
involves uh, some degree of design in it. The uh, initial goal was to create a sound installation, but uh, as I was going further, the um, concept was just becoming smaller and smaller in size, and it ended up being this kind of compact uh, sound sculpture. And I'll try to explain what the idea was behind this uh, instrument. Uh, since I was maybe uh, 11 or 12 years old, I've been playing uh, around with guitars and string instruments. And then after my 20s, I got into electronic music and I started to play with synthesizers and sequencers. And at some point I was, uh, I was very tired. Uh, and maybe some of you, if you have experience with sequencers, uh, they can very easily become uh, this kind of boring uh, machine that sounds too repetitive. The, the timings are too precise. The pitches are too precise. And it just, it's very easy to, uh, so the idea behind this project was to make a sequencer, but out of uh, like real objects and real materials, a kind of physical kind of sequencer that you can manipulate its parts to create sequences of notes. And and because this is gonna be kind of like a machine, then you, you can never control it precisely. And it's always gonna be doing its own thing. The pitches are never gonna be exactly there. So this was the idea behind the, uh, the project. And well, as you uh, seen in the video, that's kind of how this works. Uh, so if we just take a look at the instrument, there's of course, uh, let's say the semicircular base uh, on which it stands on, then you have this fire, um, these four iron columns, the entire instrument is supported by those. Then you have this fishing weights of one, One kilo each, which served to an elevator does. In the middle level, we have this, what I call the sequencer, which is more visible here. And this is the part of the instrument that uh, creates the movement and, and goes around and plucks all the strings. And on the top of the instrument, we have these mechanisms on which the strings are uh, basically seating on, on these two pulleys right here. And uh, thereby the, the string is free to uh, slide up and down. And you can do that by rotating this wheel right here. At the same time, there's this uh, bigger uh, wheel that will tell you uh, what pitches you're at at the moment. So what pitch is either segment of the string. Um, I'm just seeing now in the chat that my internet connection is not very good. Are you hearing me all this time or? Yeah, there's a few dropouts, but not too many. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, the sequencer of the instrument in a more close up. It's really just a system of discs that are interconnected uh, through a rubber uh, rubber band. That means they all move at the same time. And there's a motor hidden behind this bigger disc in the middle. Uh, the reason why the discs have different sizes is exactly so that I get a variation in the uh, in the in the rhythms of rotation of each individual uh, disc, so that I avoid uh, uh, becoming like uh, like uh, this repetitive machinic sequencer. So this is uh, um, in order to get a, a degree of uh, complexity and variation in in how the different tempos uh, occur. Uh, on top of the discs, then there's just a piece of wood with a pin on it, and uh, each one of these is responsible uh, of plucking uh, one strict segment. The entire thing is really just made out of wood and, and metal. The big parts of wood were cut in, um, into a CNC. This is plywood. The smaller parts which is the darker brown you can see here, is made out of MDF and mo most of them were cut in uh, laser cutters. And the, the most useful skill I gained through uh, this process of making was 
uh, for, uh, first of all, I realized I really like doing this thing. And then uh, the like fabrication wise, the new thing I learned is that it's really easy to make your own uh, parts uh, made out of steel. Uh, you just make the design and there's companies that will uh, laser cut through steel and they're actually accessible. Uh, so this is really important if you wanna make something that is, uh, let's say durable and they're quite robust. Uh, so three years. Later, I wanted to make the newer and the obvious one is that that, well, I don't know if this is very obvious. It has a different shape. Now it's uh, made in a, in a cylinder uh, rather than an open semicircle. So the entire object is much more compact and you can uh, take it places. Uh, but also, I've now replaced all of the MDF parts with uh, steel. And functionally, the most uh, important difference is that I completely replaced the sequencer that was previously working with uh, discs and a, and a rubber band. These have now become gears. And uh, why is this so important? Because these gears now, uh, they do necessarily have to have the same size so that they all communicate with the central gear that rotates everything. And that means now they have to have the same rhythm, which is uh, the very thing I I've been wanting to uh, step away from in the first place. So I ended up not liking this, um, this machine as it does look and it does sound like a machine. So the timings are way too exact. The only thing you can do to uh, do some variation is to change the positioning of these pins. So as you can see, there's like different uh, slots along the periphery of this disc. So you can change the, the timing of this pin, but that doesn't uh, change the fact that the uh, rhythm of rotation of this disc will always remain identical to all the other ones. So you can only get uh, repetitive uh, sequences. Uh, well, that's why I ended up, um, sorry, I'm just uh, looking at the chat again. I hope you're not losing me all the time. I'm just gonna go ahead and continue. Um, so I did end up playing more with this instrument, uh, let's say more manually. I used these long pieces of uh, steel and my fingers to play it. And uh, I'm going to show you a segment from Perfect. Now would be a very good time to play video number two.
Yes. So what you uh, saw there, it was uh, just an expert uh, from a performance in Helsinki. And you will see that at the end of this video, I'm playing this instrument in a different way. And it also sounds different. That's because I'm using this little device called an Ebo, uh, which for those of you who uh, may have uh, been playing electric guitar, you probably know this, this uh, product. It's used to uh, magnetically resonate uh, steel strings and thereby create a movement that is uh, just indefinite. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop. The oscillation doesn't stop until you run out of battery. Uh, that's how you create this continuous sounds. And now I'm using a couple of these on the instrument. And well, this at this point, I realized this is a kind of sound that I am very interested in. And I'm tired of these uh, little percussive uh, string things. And I want to go into this new kind of, uh, of sound and, and see what is possible. But I want to do that not by having to hold many of these ebos around my instrument. So I thought I let's now make a new instrument that is based on this principle. It again has many strings and it has its own built-in magnetic resonators that uh, hopefully I can find out how to uh, create so that I, I avoid uh, having to buy a bunch of these uh, ebos. So this was the, the, my idea for what the next instrument was going to be and, and the, the vision for its how is it going to be uh how's it going to sound like the other thing i realized was uh that standing up uh, i was really not comfortable with that while playing it just made me feel really awkward it may be uh, it may be uh, get tired more easily and it kind of drew the attention on me rather than on the instrument and the, the attention should always be on the instrument i think as it's you know it's this kind of a sculpture uh in itself so I made the sketch, and this is the first sketch I made um, uh, for this new instrument. Uh, it's just a line, yes, but it it it. I also don't know why it's uh, this kind of line, why it's inclined, but this was just my initial uh, vision of how this instrument is gonna look like. It's gonna be kind of vertical, standing on the ground, but it's gonna be leaning over. A little bit. I didn't know why, though. Uh, later, on, later on, I started to think a little bit more about it, and I thought, OK, it's probably made out of uh, strings placed on a plane in, next to each other. And there's probably some kind of electronic interface probably placed towards the lower part of the instrument through which you can control all of the magnetic uh, uh, drivers and make the make the instrument uh, play. Then I realized that the reason I wanted this instrument to be inclined was that so you can actually sit in front of the instrument rather than be standing, and and you can have an easier access to all the controls and to have a more comfortable uh, interaction with it. So fast forward two years later this project was completed and this is the lirai instrument which is again right behind me uh and it, this was completed in uh, 2021 and i'm gonna tell you all about this instrument but before i tell you all about it it's now even time to watch the third video and this is a video that shows a little bit of detail and will give you a very basic idea of how it sounds like. Uh, and then I'm gonna go and uh, share the details with you. So let's go and play video number three.
So that's the Lyrae, and I'm going to explain to you now how the thing works. So, um, okay, it's a simple string instrument uh, with a wooden frame. It has uh, six to eight. Uh, you can choose that, uh, six to eight strings. And each one of these strings can be set into movement by its own individual magnetic exciter, which is these little cylindrical things you can see behind the strings. On the bottom of the instrument, we have all of those electronics. I'm going to explain a little bit about them uh, later. Just you know, the important thing to understand is that you use this interface to control these electromagnets, these electromagnetic exciters, and therefore induce a movement on each string. When that's done, and each mover, uh, string is moving, then we have this row of electromagnetic uh, coils here, which are basically the microphones of the instrument. These pick up on the movement of each, each string and uh, they send out an electrical signal to an amplifier and that's, uh, that's where we get the sound from. This is how I'm able to amplify the sound. Otherwise, uh, if you don't have that, then you cannot really uh, listen to, a, uh, to anything. It doesn't have a, an acoustic sound. So um, there you have it. This is the Lirai. Uh, let's go a little bit closer again. Again, you can see here in the middle of the instrument, these are the uh, magnetic resonators. I think I took this picture before they were totally finished. So you can only see like four of them are really complete. In the bottom, we have all of that stuff. Well, you get a picture. Uh, this is a close-up of the string. It's really just a copper coil wound around a, a steel axis. And uh, there's an electric current passing through it. And that electric current transforms this, uh, this coil into a magnet. And that starts to push, uh, to pull on the steel string and release it. And if you do this on and off uh, at a well, certain frequencies, then you are going to have the string starting to move. This row of coils is, as I said, the microphones. These are the ones that detect the movement of the strings and they uh, translate it into an electric current and, uh, and afterwards into a sound when we go to our speakers. And this is the brain of the instrument. Uh, which is the interaction interface with which you control the instrument. This is basically almost a synthesizer as this is used to create electrical signals, electrical pulses, uh, square, wi square wave pulses, each of which you can see there's like eight, um, eight identical uh, sections, right? So each one of these creates a pulse for an electromagnetic exciter it creates a signal, then that exciter starts to move uh, its uh, string. And uh, the other thing we have here is these preamps. Um, okay, there's too many things in this uh, picture, but these are uh, completely necessary to elevate the, the, the the output signal of this instrument uh, to a mixing console and then from there to uh, speakers. Uh, you need to elevate the signal, otherwise you get too much noise um, in your audio. So this looks uh, much more complicated than uh, this thing, which is funny because I started uh, out trying to, let's say, replicate this device and I ended up with this. Um, so why, why, why did this happen? I'm gonna uh, try to explain to you how this happened. I did start off by trying to replicate the way that this device works. And there's, if you just Google on the internet, uh, EBO schematics, it's going to show you many uh, uh, diagrams of circuits that you can copy and supposedly you can get it to work. So that's what I did. 
I found the circuit. It's very simple uh, circuit. It's based on two coils that you can see uh, these uh, cylinders here and a little tiny amplifier in the middle. And it works with nine volts, which now I don't show in this picture. The way it works is when you connect the battery on, the output coil starts to emit a almost like a white noise uh, signal, which is, let's say, um, uh, it, it, it is a magnetic force that uh, can cause an initial movement in the string. You can imagine that the string is now exactly above these two coils. When Once the string starts to move a little bit, the input coil detects that movement. It makes a little current within uh, the coil. That current goes into the amplifier and is then sent out the output coil again. So this is a feedback uh, loop in which the string is basically forcing itself to oscillate in its own fundamental frequency. Uh, the, um, the, the coils that you see here are actually laptop speakers. So that's what you can find on the market. And I figured out uh, quite soon that you can't really work with these. They're too small and you need to go a little bit bigger, but you can't find that exact kind of coils on the market. So I started to make my own coils which are hidden inside these uh, yellow little caps that you see here. Um, and eventually I was able to get this circuit to work. However, I was not satisfied with the sound that I was getting from the strings. Uh, at this time I had a piece of wood with a string on it and I was doing these experiments uh, with this device and listening how that's, uh, how the, the sound that is produced uh, sounds like. Um, and the, the sound I was getting was just too monotonous and too static, and I didn't like that. The reason that that happens is exactly because, as I explained before, uh, this device works in a feedback mode. As soon as the string starts to move, then it's basically just forcing itself to continue uh, oscillating in that uh, in its own fundamental frequency. So this is the simplest way I can show it just symbolically. Uh, here, this string is oscillating at a um, frequency of uh, half a wavelength. That means it's, it, it is uh, its uh, fundamental uh, frequency. You can also get one full wavelength. You can get three wavelengths divided by two, which is a that is a fifth. You can get two wavelengths, which is two octaves above, etc. Uh, the point is that all of these sound very monotonous and sound very static. So I continued to experiment on this little device to try to get it to work in a different way. And one day I flipped one of these capacitors. I put it in the wrong place. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but what this resulted in was that my pickup coil basically stopped being part of the circuit. My amplifier was ignoring it. And the driver coil started to emit a frequency that was completely relevant to the string's frequency. And also it was a very strong pulse. So when I put this close to the string, I noticed completely different results in terms of sound. Because what was happening now is that if we imagine that again, this little uh, symbol here is my uh, magnetic resonator, my pickup is no longer part of the circuit. So the sounds it, it can produce are completely different. I'm gonna try now to uh, play you uh, some sounds. So I'm gonna play a sample from my experiments. And this is the first mode. I've, uh, as I said, the, the boring, let's say monotonous feedback mode. I'm hoping you can hear this.
And now I'll play you a clip of how the uh, second mode sounds like. All right. So, um, well, clearly I was much more interested in the uh, in the set. Particular ex example is quite dark and uh, eerie, maybe. But there's a huge difference from the fr from the first mode of oscillation. You can hear all of this complexity, all of these overtones happening, and this is just one string, right? And it's and it's producing like many fr different frequencies at the same time and so many overtones. So I was very excited. Uh, with this discovery and then the next step uh, was like okay so how do i how do i recreate this mistake because this was actually uh, a result of a, a complete mistake i did on the circuit i just placed the capacitor at the wrong uh, place and then my magnetic driver started to behave weirdly i didn't know how to reproduce this but i knew uh that if a very cheap microcontroller it's this green board you see here um and i gave it a very very simple uh, coding line which was make uh, give me signals of on and off that's it just electrical pulses and please allow me to control just the frequency and the amplitude of those signals and these signals are then sent to my driver coil which is here Right, one of the cylinders. This is a terrible photo, but I think you can maybe see that the string is uh, kind of oscillating here. Uh, so I was really happy to discover that I could reproduce these results that I got by accident the first time. However, digital electronics were not the way to go because if I'd use the TNC board, that would not be enough to drive all of the current I need to oscillate eight strings, right? That would burn uh, my TNC. And the second thing was that I didn't want to involve any uh, microcontrollers or uh, coding and laptops and this kind of thing. I wanted to keep this project as simple as possible. So naturally I turned to analog electronics and I found uh, these integrated circuits. It's, this is called any 555 timer. It's very commonly used in any kind of electronics where you want simple on off signals right? So just simple square waves. And with the addition of a few components, like a, a pot here and a fader, you can control the frequency and the amplitude of these signals, which is exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, the, there's another uh, bonus feature here, that is that you can also add an external signal of any kind in this circuit. That means you can plug in a, a song from your phone into this device, and that will also be translated into a magnetic uh, force. I've never really used this. Uh, uh, this one actually, because even just from the square, um, I was worried that, you know, um, it's probably not going to last uh, through time. So the way to make it last through time is to learn the key iCut software that allows you to design your own schematics. This is my secret uh, circuit. Uh, so you design your schematic and then you can design a PCB board to be manufactured by a company. 
And I got this done for maybe two euros or three euros per board. I don't know, something ridiculous like this. Uh, these are made in China. And uh, yeah, they're very nice. So it's a very happy day when you receive this in the mail. Uh, these are actually from for the preamps, so they're quite small. These ones make up the brain of the instrument. Uh, you can see there's like these separating lines. It's actually made up of four identical PCBs. So this is how I made the electronics for this instrument. Of course, it took an incredible amount of time because I, I still am actually an amateur in electronics. Uh, so, well, that's enough about the electronics. Let's go and uh, look at some structural structural uh, uh, features of the instrument. So let's uh, let's talk about the, the wood for a little bit. As you see, the uh, the entire instrument is contained within a, a rectangular frame of wood. For this, I chose a nice piece of walnut. And why I chose walnut um is that was a weird uh, choice actually because walnut is hardly ever used as a um, a tone wood in musical instruments in instruments you usually get uh woods like uh, maple or uh, mahogany uh, or what else like uh, rose wood and these kinds of woods uh however i decided to go with walnut because walnut is a very strong and very dense wood and over time it uh, it's very difficult for it to change its shape and uh, present bendings or cracks and this kind of thing. And because I have this really long and really thin uh, frame, I had to choose a wood that has excellent properties in terms of uh, maintaining its shape over time, over temperature changes, over humidity changes, and so on. The wood was put into a CNC machine to cut out the designs. By the way, the, the entire design was made in uh, Rhino. Uh, each part was designed uh, at least tens of times until I uh, concluded to the final, let's say the best uh, possible shape, thicknesses, etc. So for example, this piece of wood is the one we can see right here being cut by the machine. Every piece of wood after it was cut by the CNC, you have to process it. So you have to file the edges, you have to make it smooth, you have to do some sanding, glue some of them together, and even uh, make some new holes for assembling the entire thing. Once you assemble the frame, uh, this is a nice thing about the frame that it can sit on a table or a floor, uh, just having this little bit of distance that's maybe like 10 centimeters from the horizontal plane. And it could just sit like this. So you can put it in a hard case. Uh, you can put it like this if you wanna, I don't know, fix it or clean it or something like this. And if you wanna assemble it, you just add these two, these two leg uh, thingies over here. So metal, let's look at the metal for a little bit. Uh, all of the inner structural elements of this instrument, for example, this piece right here. Let's just look at this for a moment. So what does this piece do here? This piece holds together all of these vertical shafts that I'm assuming them, you must be seeing them turning yellow right now. All of these eight shafts hold the functional components of the instrument, which is basically the uh, the magnetic resonators, and uh, yeah, that's about it actually. Uh, so I need a piece of steel to go on here and hold all of these things, and here it is. I chose stainless steel to to do this job because, I mean, it's a very uh, solid and very uh, strong material. But most importantly, stainless steel is not ferromagnetic. That means it's not attracted uh, to magnets and it doesn't influence magnetic fields. So that means uh, if I uh, choose stainless steel for most of the inner structure of my instrument, that's not gonna have an interference with all of the magnetic things that are gonna be happening. Um, however, stainless steel is, uh, is of course conductive to electricity. So I can still use it to ground uh, all of my electronics and then have less noise. 
some of the parts had to be bent. Of course, I didn't do this. The company does this. You just give them the uh, the designed uh, parts. Let's go and. find this part to see right here. This is this one. Uh, so this one is bent. My internet connection is unstable. I hope you can hear this. Uh, this piece is bent. Derek, you wanted to say something or just thumbs up? Good, thumbs up, good. Right, so this piece is bent and then you get these nice violin fine tuners that are uh, put into these holes. This is a, a very useful thing on the instrument because uh, it allows you to uh, fine tune the, the pitches of all of the strings, even live when, while you're playing. So it's also like a, a, a playing uh, a performance uh, tool. Uh, if you go over a specific thickness in this stainless steel, then it can no longer be bent. I think this is five millimeters. This is the piece that you see over here. It holds some potentiometers on it. So this is just way too thick, they can't bend it. So, well, you just make three parts that fit into each other, that's easy. And then some smaller stuff. And as you go smaller and smaller, at some point you can't use steel anymore. So I had to turn to 3D printing to produce the really like fine parts of this instrument. And as I said before, you know, each part has, has to be designed tens and tens of times until you find the you know, the perfect dimensions and the perfect functionality for it. So um, I used uh, SLA printing for most of the things, which is nice because you get a very uh, nice finish, super high resolution, very nice texture, uh, but it is a little bit more fragile than filament printing. And it is also a little bit more expensive. So you have to be careful with these pieces. This specific part is actually the mount for these electromagnetic resonators to go on. You can actually see it a little bit in the back of this uh, photo. Uh, so it serves as a mounting, uh, mounting base for the resonator to go on. And then it has a little bit, uh, you know, some extra holes to fix things, pass cables through and this kind of thing. This is again my, uh, our driver coil, which makes the string move. And if I go ahead and open even this thing, what you will find inside looks like this. This is a bolt. Uh, it's a Vida. It's a it's a bolt of. of dimensions M3, that's three millimeters. Even the in inside of the coils, I had to make uh, the structure myself. And if we take these elements even apart, you can see there's uh, this steel bolt and then there's a 3D printed cap to go uh, on top. There's a neodymium magnet and a nut. This is a very nice step. So uh, actually, the bolts had to be uh, the sh the heads have to be shaved off to make this ending as uh, shallow as possible. Once you've shaved off the the heads, then you have to treat every single uh, uh, bolt with a droplet of lacquer to prevent future rust. And this is because it's not stainless steel. This is this is pure steel. So if you grind it, if you file it, if you sand it, it's going to prevent, it's gonna present rust uh, or corrosion at some point. So when you assemble this thing, you then need to make the copper windings. So I just put it on a drill and with patience, you start to make these windings then I would say probably the most difficult part of the entire process was to be able to solder these tiny, tiny cables to the back ending of this little tiny coil. Uh, to make these coils, there was even a lot of uh, math involved. So um, I knew what the size of the coils has to be, and I knew what the impedance of the coil has to be. Impedance is the electrical resistance of the coil. 
So then there's only one thickness of wire that will give you that impedance with that size. So you need to go through some calculations and uh, just check out different uh, different kinds of uh, thicknesses of different copper wires, and then uh, you know start. This is again another coil. This is one of the pickup coils that serve as microphones and it's it's a little bit bigger but it's made well in the same uh, process when it's done each coil needs to be dipped entirely into lacquer so you can see it's a little bit shiny that's why it's dipped in lacquer to um let's say solidify it or make it um to insulate it from oxygen and that's going to make it Hello. Yeah, we lost you for a second, but you're back. Good. Uh, I was talking about this coil, I think. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, you were dipping us in lacquer and then you disappeared. Oh, great, there. great. Okay, so we didn't miss a lot. So uh, we explained why we dip you in lacquer. And then this little part here is just one of the tens and tens. And uh, I, I think if you really go into detail, it's hundreds of pieces that make uh, that make up this, this entire instrument, uh, which was just a tremendous amount of work. It took the entire thing, uh, designing and engineering and putting the thing together uh, more or less one and a half years. Uh, and I, I, I said in the beginning that I, I do, I did study architecture, but I don't really practice architecture in a traditional way. But uh, the, to me, this is a kind of uh, architecture uh, to take all of these elements and, and all of these tools and, and and these technologies and to put them together uh, possible and makes this one artistic uh, goal be, be possible. And that's uh, pretty much all I had to say about this instrument. And we can now maybe end with a very, very short video and then I'm happy to take any questions. Bravo. Thank you. I, I found it a really, uh, an absolutely beautiful, fascinating project. Aesthetically, you present it really, the, the presentation of the instrument itself is, is immaculate. Um, and you've done, a, like, the, to my mind anyway, a really great job in explaining technically how you arrived at things. Um, I'm not sure how people, with a little bit less experience, possibly with electronics, would interpret it. But um, it really, really well done. Um, I have one small question, which is: um, I saw that you still you have two slots on your your receptacle there for your coils. Was the original plan that you were going to put the feedback coil back in there as well? 
Yeah, that's why, because the the initial design always I had in the back of, of my mind, you can always, if you want it, at some point, just add another coil in there, connect it to the where it has to go. But also you can, uh, this is also something I still haven't tried, uh, use two driver coils and maybe send out two different uh, pulses on each one. But uh, again, that's, I'm, I'm still so busy with what you can already do with the instrument that these extra things I haven't tried, but there's this option. That's why there's this, right. this hole there. No, it's, it's great because what you're essentially doing is you're treating the string itself as a filter for whatever signal you're sending out of the coils. It's kind of like a waveguide filter that's, yeah, it's, it's shaping the resulting harmonics. Yeah, we could talk. We could talk electronics for a really long time, but maybe there's some questions in the chat or from the room. There's some consultation going on. <laughs> uh, have any questions from? Oh, come on over here. You can hang out by my so, computer. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Hello there. Um, we don't have any questions from the audience or? Uh, ah, we have one question from Joseph. Yeah. Yep. Question is coming. We're changing microphones. Uh, awesome. So, okay. So, I mean, fantastic job. I really enjoyed um, all the passion and um, that, that you put in making the instrument. So my question is, uh, which one do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy more playing the instrument or do you enjoy more making the instrument? Uh, okay, so there is, exact, there is one moment in time that is at, right at the intersection of these two things. And, and that moment in time is after you've been making for so long, maybe it's been a year, that you're just sanding wood and gluing stuff and nothing is working anymore. Uh, and, and, and you're just uh, every day at this, the edge of just desperation and uh, wanting to give up. And then th there comes this one day which, when things work and you hear the instrument for the first time and it's still just maybe two strings after that day, you continue uh, making it and uh, you start to play it. But that moment in time is my personal favorite time when you get to see that uh, what you've made so far has kind of some uh, potential. Afterwards, when you start to play it, uh, you know, I... I again, you get tired of it very easily. Uh, both can uh, make you very tired uh, eventually because you're doing the same thing over and over again. But there's nothing that I enjoy more than the you know the moment where just things come together and you hear it for the first time. So that's just like one day in these uh, last three years. Hi, my name is Derek Holzer. Um, I am a PhD researcher at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, the work that I do concerns um, investigating historical uh, synthesizers used mainly in the history of electronic music in Sweden and um, doing certain kinds of investigations on those instruments, both the history of them and the way that they were built. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then trying to imagine what those instruments mean to us now. And uh, that's a really big question. Um, so here's a little bit more about me, and here is also a small introduction to a man that's going to make a, a large chunk of my presentation. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see um, 
let's call it a historical reenactment of a situation. Um, I believe that the top photograph was made in the year of my birth, which was 19 <coughs> something or other. And um, below that is uh, maybe about 10 years ago when I, uh, when I re well, okay. No, actually it was before the year of my birth. Thank you. Thank you for the captions. Um, uh, the top photograph is a gentleman named Erke Kurenemi. I will introduce you in depth to Erke Kurenemi a little bit later. Um, and the bottom photograph is me kind of reenacting this image of Kurenemi with this original instrument that Kurenemi designed. We will also meet that instrument in some depth a little bit later on as well. Um, this idea of reenactment is very interesting to me and it's, it's come to me a lot in, um, it's come to me a lot in my studies. What does a reenactment mean? Does it, does it mean that we try to reproduce as accurately as possible something that happened to other people in another time, in our time now with different people? Or is it a situation where we try to, um, we try to get the essence of what that historical event was and work with that and see what the essence of that historical event means to us now. For the purposes of this argument, I'm going to opt for the latter. We're gonna meet some of the historical context and then we're gonna kind of compare it with our context now and see what goes on. There's a whole bunch of organizations that are on this slide, um, which are different partners in my research, which um, include the College of Music in Stockholm, the Royal Institute of Technology, where I study and work, and the Swedish Performing Arts Agency, the Musikverket, which has a museum that has this kind of uh, Indiana Jones archive of old instruments. If you've ever wanted to be in a room with a hundred harpsichords that are sitting there waiting for the apocalypse, there's a hundred harpsichords waiting for the apocalypse. Nobody can play them because they're machine, not machine, they're sorry that I'm hearing these machine sounds. They're museum objects. They're, um, they're, they're meant as documents rather than performing instruments, which is a very interesting distinction. So in my work, I have to treat also these old synthesizers more like documents than as performing instruments. And that, that colors your interpretation as well. How do we talk about music instruments? Um, traditionally, we use this idea of what's called organology. We, uh, we divide this uh, platonic category of uh, music instrument into little subcategories. And these subcategories are mainly based on what makes the sound, what is physically causing the sound. Is it blowing into a tube and splitting the air and making that resonate and oscillate the way that Nicolina was demonstrating earlier this evening? Is it making a chord move in the air the way that Mihailis was demonstrating? Is it banging on an object and making that object resonate out into space? Um, there's other breakdowns. These are just some examples of how traditional organology would categorize instruments. Um, my talk is about purely electronic instruments, where Nicolina had an aerophone that she was activating in certain ways. Mihailis had a chordophone that he was activating in different ways. I'm not playing drums. Um, I'm working with electronics. And the thing that creates sound in electronics is the speaker, full stop. It's a moving piece of paper that you know, has, a, has a coil of wire and a magnet behind it. And the way that you get that speaker to move is by sending electricity to it. Everything else about electronic music is just figuring out clever ways to control the flow of electricity. And you can go back into the techniques of electronic music and you can start to figure out, okay, well, how do I make the electricity do this? And how do I make the electricity to do that? Most electronic musicians that I talk about never think about it that way. But the highest level is that you're chopping up electricity to move a speaker around. And that, that puts us outside of this a little bit because the sound causation happens from the speaker and everything else happens in this more um, abstract world of talking about electrons or talking about bits of numbers wobbling back and forth to control a flow of electrons. It's a very different idea than this because we're not physically aware of those processes anymore. We could if we put I don't know, an oscilloscope or we kind of dived inside the object. It's a very different thing. So my argument is, when, especially when we talk about electronic instruments, I think that this is a really, this is a dead end. 
And there's other things that make it a much more interesting discussion. Um, we can certainly talk about the materials that make up an instrument. We can talk about how an instrument is built and what kind of components it has inside of it, and how big the speaker is and how long the wires are, all those sorts of things. And that describes it on the physical plane of what we encounter as an object. However, these other things have more to do with how that object relates to things outside of itself. This little uh, description here comes from uh, a pair of authors, uh, Tresh and Dolan. And they have kind of taken these categories from the writings of the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And to make Michel Foucault really short, Michel Foucault was very concerned and interested with the dynamics of how power exists in society. Not necessarily that one person has power over another person, but rather how power pervades society, how we live within fabrics of power, how we enact power and how we respond to power. It's never, it's never that power is in one place. It's rather that power is everywhere. You're swimming in it. And this is how we understand our relationships to power. Uh, for him. So when he gave these kind of categories of this kind of uh, mediations and, and ends and things like that, he was thinking about the individual in society. But we can talk about the instrument in society as well. Interestingly, Tresh and Dolan are talking about two things which they paired, which I like. They were talking about music instruments, but they were also talking about scientific instruments. For example, think of a microscope. And you can also think that a microscope is, is something that does these things as well. It has a material disposition. It does certain things. It's made of certain parts. Um, but it does these other things. The other things are, uh, there's a mode of mediation. And that is the mediation between you and the object. That means that the object sometimes has a will of its own. Like my mobile phone, which does 10 million things while I'm sleeping and I wake up and the whole you know, inside of it has changed without letting me know what it's done even. Um, objects or instruments can be transparent. They can show you that they're doing things apart from you, or they can hide those things from you. They can be autonomous in the sense that they don't ask you, they just do it. Or they can be semi-autonomous. They ask you, or they inform you, they bring you along for the process. Or the classic example is a completely passive object, um, like a hammer which doesn't do anything until you pick it up and let it fall. So there's different things. And I would argue that the more an object does this thinking for you, the more an instrument makes decisions for you, the more you're engaging with a collaboration or a discussion with the person who designed that instrument to do those things and to make those decisions. This is especially challenging in computer music where we download software that somebody else has programmed and we go through the reality that that person has given you and the sets of possibilities that are provided within that environment. The map of mediations talks about the relationship between that object, that instrument, and the bigger picture, the society around it. How does uh, an instrument reinforce or work against certain societal assumptions that we have? For example, um, a piano keyboard reinforces a lot of what we understand about Western music. It kind of forces us to play within a certain sort of uh, framework, let's say, a framework of notes and scales that have come down to us over hundreds of years of um, development. Um, and they've been fossilized in this object where um, if it's not, if it's a note that's in between those two keys, unless you do some radical adjustment, like open up the piano and stick a screwdriver in there and start messing around, uh, you'll never find that note. So you're channeled, let's say. The final thing is uh, this uh, lovely Greek word telos, uh, this idea that there's an end to that thing. Why was this object created? For what purpose? And that doesn't mean that the object has to fulfill that purpose always. There are plenty of examples most examples in the history of instruments and objects where somebody has decided to use them against their intended purpose and actually reached much more interesting conclusions. The example that I gave in the workshop are these drum machines from the early 1980s that were meant for to accompany like a practice accompaniment for somebody playing another kind of an instrument and eventually were found 
discarded, cheap or broken or um, on garage sales and things by uh, African American musicians in Detroit in the early 1980s. And they started making techno music and house music using these things. They decided that what they wanted was actually a completely automated music that only these objects could create. That was not what the Japanese intent, uh, engineers of Roland ever intended these things to be used for. They might have been horrified that you would try to actually make somebody listen to this drum machine as a performance for like an hour or something. So, so a telos is an interesting idea and all these things are part of a discussion. Um, oops, there was another slide in there that I think disappeared. Okay, I think that's enough for this kind of theoretical part. Um, definitely happy to take questions about it a little bit later. Um, technology in general tends to have two things packed into it. It, it. it wants to satisfy us in ways, and particularly under capitalism, it wants to sell us solutions to problems, or it wants to sell us ideas. Um, but there's motives there, and there's two motives. And I'd like to talk about the first one, which is hopes. Um, this is gonna be a very short clip from a documentary, which I highly recommend. You can find this kind of rent, you can like rent this virtually, I think on Vimeo called Sisters with Transistors from Lisa Rovner. We're going to hear the voice of Lori Spiegel that you see in the, uh, in the image here, um, who worked with uh, computer music very early. Um, this is a, a, a computer that she programmed specifically, um, I believe at MIT, to do different sorts of music composition and music performance. Um, but she has a very interesting perspective about why people would be interested in electronic music, particularly women. Do I not get sound? Uh-oh, there we go. Let's start that again. Technology is a tremendous liberator. It blows our power structure. Women are actually drawn to electronic music. You didn't have to be accepted by any of the male-dominated resources. You can make something with electronics and you can present music directly to the audience. And that gives you tremendous freedom. All right. So for Laurie Spiegel, the idea that you had an instrument that you could make something really complex with, and you could take that instrument to a room and plug it in and play it for people was a liberation from having to ask permission from other people, permission to perform, permission to record, permission to access certain things. Um, it was uh, anarchist dream, right? So we have hopes, but we also have fears. Um, some of you have seen this clip already. I'm gonna play this one again. Um, and I'm going to preface it with the, with the same stuff, which is, um, this is going to be a clip from 1960. This is going to be um, an advertisement from a company that you've never heard of called IBM for some of the fantastic things that they've done to improve the quality of our life. Um, one thing to look at is how in 1960, one interacted with this kind of computer. Think a little bit about the similarities and the differences but also think about how a computer exists to model something that exists in the real world, make changes or decisions based on that model, and then apply those decisions back to the real world. Here we go. This is where America's peace of mind begins. Around the clock, radars, electronic eyes watch the skies and report what they see to stage defense system of the United States Air Force. Here is a stage center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The stage computer speeds the information for decisions by man in our missile air. Every scheduled flight across American frontiers is recorded ahead of time on IBM punch cards, then fed into the stage computer. Now the computer can draw a picture of what is supposed to be in the sky at any moment. It continually compares this expected picture with the real picture as seen by radar. If a flying object does not belong, it appears on this viewing screen. There's one now at the right of the screen. They call it a blip, unknown flying object. Friend or foe, within seconds the Air Force will know. 
The officer fires a light gun at the target cliff. This tells the computer to track the object. At the launching site, a long-range Beaumont missile is ready for firing. Now they ask the computer to calculate an intercept point. X marks the spot where the Beaumont missile would meet the moving target if fired immediately. The officer in charge makes the final decision. Fire. At the moment of launching, the Beaumont missile received instructions from the IBM computer. As the missile screams toward target, radar keeps on tracking. With electronic control, the computer automatically adjusts the missile to meet any change in the target flight. There is no escape. This was a test, one of many successful tests of the Sage Beaumont security team, our new system of air defense. To be ready for the worst, so that the worst will never happen, America is now armed with instant electronic reflexes. The Sage computer, made by IBM, is another example of the fast new powers that man can achieve through the creative use of his mind. Strength for national defense. Speed for informed decisions. Search for a growing America. This is IBM. Freeing man's mind to shape the future. Okay, I could, I could talk, and I probably have talked for hours, about this, you know, two and a half minute video. Um, two takeaways. One is the tagline that you see at the end, freeing man's mind to shape the future. Um, one of the hallmarks of cybernetics was the idea that we would get rid of drudgery, we would get rid of labor that kind of um, bogs down our mind with useless stuff or bogs down our bodies with useless stuff. We've got robots to wash the dishes, we've got robots to clean the cars, we've got robots to mow the lawn. Um, and now we're free to pursue creative activities like watching TikTok all day on our phones. So, um, so there's this liberation that's kind of inherent in technology or in, in this utopian ideas of technology. So that's a hope, right? But there's the whole point of this is that we're trying to get rid of fear. And the fear is of something that's unknown. We're looking at something that resembles a kind of a surveillance state, right? Everything that's in the air is registered. If it's not registered, we need to know what it is. If we still don't know what it is, we have to destroy it. That's a really interesting binary split there where the unknown is a threat. And if we can't verify what it is, let's just get rid of it before it causes any trouble. Um, that's supposed to make us let more free by having less fear. And that's another motivation of technology. I would encourage you to go home and look around objects in your house and see which of these things they are addressing. Are they addressing your hopes that your life is better? Or are they addressing your fears that your life might get worse without them? And finally, we still have all these fears. It's not these, the, the things that some of these technological innovations try to cure for us don't really go away, which also begs the question, can we solve these things with technology alone? That's also an open question. Um, coming back to this analysis of electronic sound instruments, there's one other thing that I wanted to bring up, which is this idea of affordances. I talked a lot about affordances with the workshop participants. And affordance is a little bit different from a, funk, uh, um, a feature. In the synthesizer you see, the keyboard is a feature. It's a thing that was provided by the designer. The patch bay, which is in the middle of the synthy there, which has these little pegs that you can plug in and make electrical connections, is a feature that's provided by the designer. However, both of those interfaces um, can be hacked and different performance methods um, can be used to get very different results out of each one of those features that the designer never would have intended. Um, the illustration below shows you affordances of a concrete pipe, which is meant to shoot water or shit or something, you know, something you don't want to look at and see under the ground away from you. However, if you're into parkour or urban exploration or skateboarding, a concrete pipe offers very different possibilities and it offers different possibilities depending on what you are looking for. That's something that's not a feature, that's an affordance. That's something that comes out of a relationship between you and that object. 
And that's something that gives the object agency, which is something that ideas of science and technology studies and actor network theory and social construction of technology all address this idea that as a socially constructed object, technology has an agency. And the things that we talked about earlier, these maps and modes of mediation and the telos that the, the designer of that object wants to put into it all affect how that object acts on you in that relationship of finding these affordances. Um, media archaeology is something that uh, I consider to be my practice. And media archaeology is basically the idea of going back and looking at past media artifacts to see what they meant in the time that they were made and what they mean to us now. We spent a little bit of time going over this particular image also in the workshop. Um, this is a picture of, uh, or this is an artist rendition of something that may or may not have actually existed called the light beam piano by uh, uh, engineer Grindel Matthews, H. Grindel Matthews. This is the cover of Science and Invention magazine from the year 1926. For 1926, this picture represents the future, um, but with a connection to the past. Going from right to left, we see a woman in a fashionable 1920s dress. Um, and she is seated at the keyboard of, if you don't look at the rest of it, a normal organ or a piano. It has our traditional Western scale laid out. But from there, things start to go a little bit weird. There's these spinning fiery discs with laser beams shooting through them. There's this glass box that has these glowing tubes or valves in them. And as we go back further, there's these horns that we might recognize from, for example, gramophones, which are also a very con like contemporary media technology of the 1920s. And finally, if we bring our eyes down to the lower left-hand corner of the image, we see that the artist has taken great pains to show us that this thing is plugged into the wall with an electrical cable, that this thing is wired. Now, this object is in some ways similar, but mostly fundamentally different to this utopian technology object that we carry around in our pockets all day long. This object is big. It doesn't fit in our pocket. It's indiscreet. It doesn't have headphones. It's very hot and very heavy because of all the electronics and the tubes. Um, and it has to be connected to the wall all the time. Now, I said earlier, this is the exact opposite of our you know, utopian device. But then I was reminded these things get hot. And we do actually have to connect them to the wall sometimes. And if you leave them on the table in the middle of the workshop and your phone goes off, and you haven't turned off the speaker, they're also quite indiscreet. So no, we haven't solved any of those problems either yet. But in the 1920s, this is really what the future looked like. Now it looks quite antiquated. Um, but going back and figuring out what it meant then and what it means now is a very interesting practice. And it teaches us just as much about that object as our relationship to this one, this phone that we carry around. Design fiction, so by the way, this picture is also a design fiction. That object may or may not have existed, and it may or may not have done the things that are promised by this very beautiful uh, artist rendition. Similarly, this object on the right-hand side is also a, what we would call a design fiction. Any Star Trek fans in the room? Star Trek is so out now. It's okay. All right. I was, I was really into Star Trek when I was a kid in the 1980s, at least. Um, so this object is uh, an object that the science people, um, there's, I think on the Starship Enterprise, there's like security and there's science and there's medical and then there's like commanders like Captain Kirk or something. So the science people like Dr. Spock carry around one of these guys. And this is like something that they use to analyze things and record information. Now, I think Star Trek takes place about five or 600 years into the future of right now. However, if you look closely at this picture of what an artist imagined this tricorder to look like, you're going to see electronics technology from the 1960s being used to build something that's supposed to be 600 years in the future. You've got these big clunky capacitors and resistors. You've got these tin can transistors in there. You have like a CRT television display for the video part of it, which you know is uh, quite funny actually. Um, However, they, 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 they've got a bailout, which is if you look at the very bottom of the picture, you can see that it's a 20th century substitute and they have to draw it that way because the real technology is prohibited from you by the uh, prime directive, which says that you can't share technology to a planet that isn't ready for it. 
So obviously you're not ready to know how this thing really works. But it's a design fiction. It's a speculative idea about something that's going to exist in the future for some specific purposes. Design fiction is what we did in the workshop over the last two days. Design fiction uses familiar things to help us talk about the unfamiliar. It uses, um, it, it uses designs where we don't need to worry about whether or not that design can really be made. It's more about the idea of the design and what we can learn from talking about the design. And of course, as the last, the last slide in this slide show you, uh, design fictions of the past become media archeologies of the future. From our perspective now, we look at this thing from 1968 or whatever it is, 1975, and we go, oh, it's so silly. Why did they draw it like that? Um, it tells us about them. It tells us about us as well, actually. Um, yeah, we'll do some more video. This is a design fiction from 20 years ago. Let's look at it first. You've probably seen this film. I show eight how to the district, going by race and eight. And the license registration. She went to camp for more You're going to have to watch the rest of the film now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this was just simply one of many um, technological artifacts that were invented for the film uh, Minority Report. The, the, the brief for the technical design of these future technologies in Minority Report wasn't to create something so fantastical that the audience wouldn't believe it. It was actually quite the opposite. They wanted the audience to really think that what they were looking at was so possible that it might even already exist without them knowing about it. This is a really good example of that, this ultra haptic technology where the interface, the interface design is so streamlined that this uh, trained human being um, played by um, that actor with chin uh, can get in there and rearrange information and tunnel down into it and find what he was looking for as fast as possible, optimized, being ready to go. The uh, consultants for this film are very interesting. They hired people like Douglas Copeland, who's a very famous uh, author, writing uh, different books about mostly uh, contemporary technology and its effects on society. Darren Lanier, who was one of the first uh, pioneers of virtual reality, actually became later one of its biggest opponents. Um, and then some people that were involved in MIT. There was a whole team of graduates from MIT working. Stuart Brand is an interesting character because in the 1970s, he pioneered something which um, really, he pioneered several things which kickstarted our idea of the modern internet. Um, the whole earth catalog, which was a catalog of catalogs and books. It's kind of a meta reference, a, a paper search engine, so to speak, to find information. And eventually something called the well, which was a uh, one of the first online meeting places. Um, uh, Gershfeld and Mitchell were both professors um, and directors of departments at MIT, um, especially um, specializing in interaction. So the idea was to come up with interaction design that looked very plausible. And 20 years later, I don't know if we're at that level yet, but certainly in our pockets and on our tablets and in all of our touch displays, we're getting very close to this place where we can intelligently track fingers. And not only do we just have like a one-to-one -one thing where like my mouse goes from one side of the screen to the other, but rather I can make a gesture on that thing. And that gesture has a symbolic value beyond the movements that retrieves other kinds of information. Really prescient stuff. In 2022, it was considered a design fiction. It was considered something that wasn't quite here yet. But 
tantalizingly so. And it talks about our desire for those kinds of things as well. In electronic sound instruments, there are some utopias which are very formal. And these are things that we expect instruments, electronic instruments to do. And I would argue that for the hundred plus years, like over a century of history of electronic instruments, these are things that we want. We want in varying degrees of these things, maybe not all of them at once. Uh, we wanna be able to imitate existing instruments. We want a synthesizer that sounds like a flute. We want one that sounds like a bass guitar. Um, we wanna realize complex compositions without an orchestra. This is one of the things that Laurie Spiegel was talking about. You don't wanna to have to go ask permission to borrow an orchestra and borrow a concert hall. You wanna be able to realize it. you wanna be able to hear it back immediately. This also means that you can compose things which are quite complex and beyond your ability as one artist working in your studio alone to play. You can't play all the parts of a complex composition, even if you can play a piano. So there's a storage and editing of music information to make a complex composition. And there's an automation of playback. So you can hear it played back without needing to hire a violinist and 30 other people uh, to, to play this piece for you. And then there's this more avant-garde idea of discovering sounds that have never been heard before, whether through synthesizing a sound through artificial means or taking an existing sound and making it so unfamiliar that it becomes its own object, let's say, its own sort of sound object. Um, let's keep these in particular goals in mind as we move through the next part of this talk, which is Kudanami. I could take a break here for a second if people have any questions about the first part before we dive into this rather stern, hypnotic gazed Finnish man. Anything that people would like clarified? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. The, this, this lab is full of hopes and perhaps some fears as well that are laid by technology. Uh, one of our hopes is that we can produce things faster. We can produce things more efficient. Every, every one of these kind of production devices like these printers and these cutters and things like that are um, they're labor saving devices, right? For, for you to cut out this stencil for your woodblock prints by hand would take, well, okay. First of all, how long, you made a rather large one the first morning that I was here. And how long did it take to laser cut it? It took uh, two hours. How long would it have taken for you with hand tools to create the same stencil? Two months. Two months. So this represents a hope that we're saving that time. What? So um, by quick math, you have earned um, how many hours of your life back by doing it in, in the laser cutter? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we drive them more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so instead of winning time back to do other things like watch TikTok or take vacations with your family, you you want a chance to come to Cyprus and sit here and make even more objects. Interesting. No, I, I, I don't think that we've ever gotten rid of hopes and fears. If we didn't have hopes and fears in the field of technology, we actually wouldn't innovate things either. Um, and so there's the hope that either he wins more time or he wins more productivity. Um, on the other hand, there are 
um, security locks on the door where you need a card to get in, right? Um, that's obviously a product of a fear. That's obviously the product of uh, we don't want unauthorized people coming in and doing unauthorized things. Um, one of the other examples we talked about in the workshop was contact tracing, which is a very prescient issue right now, where we trade off some of our personal liberties and we, tra we trade off some of our personal privacy, hopefully for the greater gain of people around us, the city, the country, the world we live in or something like that. Um, and it's very open to abuse, which is a fear. So maybe we build some things in there to allay the fear of abuse of a contract, contact tracing system. I think that all of those things are very, very, very valid motivations for things. Um, and again, I invite you, take a single object in your house and deconstruct it. Think why it was made, think what purposes it serves and think, is that a hope or a fear or is it something else? I would like to agree with you and say that we hold the power. Yes, you have the power to build a laser cutter. Yes, you have the power to build a 3D printer that extrudes ceramics like I saw back in the, in the thing here. Um, however, the next steps, steps that are taken in things like augmented reality and machine learning, artificial intelligence, optical recognitions of things, uh, machines that make decisions for you, machines that can decide whether uh, another human being is a threat or not and annihilate them if they are a threat. Those aren't decisions that uh, we are doing in fab labs like this. That kind, of, that kind of technological development happens on another plane of existence, which is still very much an elite plane of existence. It's still very much uh, something that is not a democratic process at all, I think. And um, the, the main motivations behind a great many technological innovations are actually um, either based on industry or military applications, which have their own sets of, of motivations. So yes, we can 3D print things. That's awesome. But there are other things that are happening above that level. So um, one example would, um, that I used in a, a book that I wrote a little while ago was the Microsoft HoloLens, which was an augmented technology visor that you would wear. And um, the, you know, our, our kind of layman's understanding of it is, oh, I can play video games and it's in this visor and I can kind of see stuff and there's kind of information. It's sort of like a, sort of like a augmented reality. There were also medical applications of the HoloLens, which were a uh, heads up display for uh, surgeons doing complicated medical operations. Let's say I'm doing open heart surgery or brain surgery and I want a feed of information or some sort of augmented magnified view of some part or something like that. That was, that was one idea but the main sponsors behind it were the US Army. And they were looking for a visor that a soldier could wear in the field to identify targets faster, have that information feed there. So um, driving forces can be, um, by our terms anyway, for thinking about democratic access to technology, quite sinister. I hope that that answers that question, at least for now. We can totally talk about it afterwards if you like as well. Anything else that people would like to clear up before we dive into the mind of Kurunami here? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say was related to the failures of the hope or fear is quite binary. There's lots of creativity. Yeah. I would I would assign creativity on the hope factor. Hopes of hopes of creating uh, okay, hopes of doing some of those things. Yeah. But this could be uh, Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're we're not we're not bound to the telos of an object. 
We're never, that's the liberation is we're never bound to the telos of an object. Um, the fact that every sort of oscillator, every sort of clock sequencer, every sort of filter was probably designed in the beginning part of the 20th century to better drop bombs on other human beings doesn't stop us from making electronic music with them. But we should probably be aware that that's where they came from in the first place. But we hopefully get to pervert that uh, telos a bit. Does Kudanami approve? Mm, it's hard to tell. He's got quite a stern look on his face. Um, Erke Kudanami is, um, for me, kind of Finnish Renaissance man. Um, he was an engineer, he was a technician, um, he was an electro electronic instrument designer, which is the main part that we're going to be looking at. He was an artist in his own right. He created sound compositions, he created robotic installations. Um, and um, Although you won't find the word futurologist in his Wikipedia biography, I'm going to argue that he was a futurologist and that a lot of those things that he was talking about are things that we're actually looking at in this room right now, which is why I wanted to kind of bring him into this discussion. He had a lot to say about the digitization of art and the ways that digital technologies can help us realize art, um, which we'll come to quite quickly. Um, but let's look at a few instruments first. This is an instrument that I get to play with a little bit in my work. This is the Andromatic. This is um, kind of a, a step sequencer and synthesizer that he designed for the Swedish composer, Ralph Lundsten. Uh, Lundsten loved this instrument. It was one of his favorite synthesizers and it was basically next to one of his hands in his studio for about 40 something years. Um, what makes Kurinami a little bit different from other electronic music instrument designers of his day was that people like Moog and Buchla and Serge Cherepnin, um, they were interested in analog technology. They were interested in analog oscillators. They were interested in doing everything with this kind of analog movement of electrons through analog components. Um, Kurinami was a very early proponent of doing things digitally. So what we're looking at there is actually a sequencer that's based on digital counters using a digital shift register to actually shift bits of information, a bit of information simply being whether the power in that bit is high or low, whether there's a presence of voltage or an absence of voltage. So it's kind of an analog version of digital in a way. And he was very into digital and the oscillators are digital. They're very much like the digital oscillators that Mihailis was showing that he built out of these very simple parts as well. Um, and then finally, on the right hand side, there's some analog tone controls. There's some uh, fixed bandpass filters, which are very resonant, make this kind of popping sort of sound. Um, and the instrument is played by setting these beautiful switches along the bottom there into various sorts of positions to create different sorts of patterns. We'll, we'll listen to a small chunk of a pattern that I just threw in there fast. You don't need to turn that off. You don't need to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the things that Nihilus was saying about um, uh, sequencers bears really true with this instrument. It can be very mechanical, it can be very repetitive. Um, you get some interesting polyrhythms going on when you start creating uh, subroutines with the switches, which is there's, there's a possibility of creating a loop inside of a loop with them. Um, but it generally comes back to these same kind of patterns over and over again. But this is how digital technology works, actually. It's, it's, it, what it excels in is reproducing the same information over and over and over again. And that's something to keep in mind because it's very much in mind with the visions that Kurinami had of being able to reproduce things endlessly. If you ask uh, somebody who plays analog synthesizers, um, 
let's say I go to your studio and uh, I find something, you know, you've set up a patch in your gear and um, I unplug all the cables and I move all the knobs around and I go, okay, can you get it again? No, you'll never find this one. You might get close. If you took a picture of it, you really remember where everything was, you get close, but it's not reproducible in that way. You'll never find the same thing again. That was, um, strangely enough, one of the complaints about analog synthesizers. Where are the presets? Now we, now we love analog synthesizers and we're like, yes, give me that unpredictable thing. I'm so tired of having the same preset all the time. So these are uh, uh, clashing values within electronic music. This is probably Kurenemi's most famous instrument. Uh, DIMI stands for Digital Music Instrument. And this is the DIMI A. So it was the first, what he considered his first real digital music instrument. Inside there um, is a computer of sorts, but it's a computer made out of digital logic chips. There's no central processor. Everything is simply a piece of memory or a clock or a shift register to address parts of that memory. So there's like, I don't know, 200 chips in there or something like that. And they're all wired together in different sorts of ways. It's a 10 step, uh, why did I write 10 step sequencer? Because the last slide said 10 step sequencer. Ignore 10 step sequencer. Um, it was built for Ralph Lundston. Uh, Lundston did not use it for four decades. This is copy pasta error. Um, Lundston actually used it for a little while and then he donated it to the museum that I'm working with now. Um, the last line is, however, mostly correct. Um, it has 128 steps and 128 commands per step. The way that you play this instrument is you have these two kind of electro pens in your hand. And on the right hand side, you're controlling the steps between these 128 steps and the commands. And on the left side, you're entering data into there. Um, it's very unintuitive to play. It's really difficult to do anything in real time with it. And there's no visual memory of what you've entered into there. When you've entered into a step, you go to the next step and you hope that the last step was remembered and you enter the next thing. And the only way you'll ever know is by going back and replaying the steps in real time. So it has a digital memory, but it's very bad at telling you what's in that digital memory. Um, very challenging instrument. And it takes a long time to enter things into there. Um, what's the first thing somebody does when they develop a brand new groundbreaking electronic music instrument and they wanna demonstrate its capabilities to the world? Do they make an abstract avant-garde composition? No, they play Bach on it to prove that it's really a music instrument. So here is a transcription. Wow, I really have another copy pasta. Sorry about that. Um, this, is a, this is a tape that Kudanimi made pro, trying to program a Bach piece into his Dini um, so that he could, uh, he could do it. There's a, limited, no, there's a limited amount of memory. And as the tape rolls through, uh, my colleague uh, Mika Oyanen made this. You'll actually see the splices in the tape where he stopped and then he had to reprogram it and then cut the next piece of tape and tape them together. And you'll see the splice kind of go through here. So we won't listen to the whole thing, but I want to give you a sense of the sound and the timbre and let's say the very mechanicalness of it. Second splice. Third splice. OK. 
Okay, actually, we did end up hearing the whole thing. Um, Miko can tell you a lot more about that, um, that piece. One of the things that's kind of interesting is when you look at the sound file that he recorded, when you see things that look like they're kind of a, a so when, you, when, you, when you see the parts that sound like they're kind of a sweep up, you realize that they're completely stepped because they're very discreet, right? If the volume goes up, it goes up in these really discreet steps. If the pitch goes up, it goes up in these really discreet steps. It doesn't smoothly glissando or, or rise in intensity at all. It sounds extremely 8-bit, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's actually what I was hoping somebody was gonna say. It really does sound like a video game. It does have a programmable uh, analog filter in it, which, uh, which uh, like a computer uh, game would not have had um, to add a little bit more warmth to it. But yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cold and, and 8 bitty sounding for sure. You, um, you program it with these guys. So here are locations and here are data to be entered into those locations. So you're sitting there, tap, 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 tap. Next step, tap, 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 next step. Really slow process. You don't have the acceptance of the One of the parameters is tempo. You heard that in the transcription, they were changing tempos. So one of these things that you can choose over here is to choose the tempo for the bar that you're working in at that particular moment. But then you have to remember that you put it in there because <laughs> there's no display. There's no way of getting any visual recognition out of this of, of what you've done. So one of the things that um, another guy, Yari Suomenen, discovered about this was that if you just start stacking too much information on a step, it glitches out in these really beautiful ways. And that was his way of, of actually performing with it in real time, is he would just kind of run through steps really fast and scramble information into them and get something that was sounded much more contemporary. Um, but probably he's the only person in the world that's ever played it live. There's another video of uh, Ralph Lundsten. Um, and there's a, somebody there and they ask him, well, you know, can, can you show us how you program it? And he says, okay, I, I'll program you a boogie woogie. And he kind of puts a little boogie woogie riff in there or something like that, but it takes a second. It's not quite real time. Okay, um, Dimi O. Dimi O uh, has the correct uh, information on the slide, that's good. Uh, Dimi O is really mind blowing for me because this was something that we had to wait until uh, you know, 30 more years or 40 more years to be able to realize um, through other means. Dimi O is something that was controlled by a camera. It was a computer sequencer where you could kind of put notes into a sequence, but those sequences could be triggered by video information coming in from a camera. This is 1971. Could any of you, now you get your sense of what uh, Finnish man sounds like. Here we go. Your interface permits one to see the contents of the memory on the TV screen. So uh, first, the simple way of using this instrument is to just playing it like an organ. Mm. And the difference being that what you play is stored into the memory and it is displayed as a kind of uh, graphical notation on the monitor screen. Then uh, one can continue and uh, start to transform the stored pattern, for instance, moving, transposing, uh, reading, or uh, playing back the uh, backwards, adding, using, erasing it, and Okay, so far, so good. This looks like any sequencer that anybody would have used like in the 1980s or the 1990s or something like that. We can plug information in, we can play it back, we can change the order, the direction, all those sorts of things like that. This solves all the problems of the DMA, which was that we put all this information and we couldn't see it anymore. So this was the first problem that he was trying to solve is I want to make compositions but I want to be able to see what I put in there and I want to be able to edit it with ease later. 
let's keep going. Oop, let's let's yeah, start that one again. So what happens next? Okay, so the, the addition of this video camera allows a very different way of interacting with this object. And that, that way of interacting with that object doesn't depend on musical knowledge of how to read notes. It doesn't depend on physical ability of playing a keyboard. It simply depends on body movement as it relates to some information that's stored there. I find that really revolutionary. There were a lot of experiments going on, especially in the early 1970s, with a combination of music and video art. And that's actually another field of study that I'm very involved in. Um, and a lot of them were more in the analog domain of having one signal affect the other or listening to the video signal or having the sound signal manipulate the video in some way. But this is one of the only ones really um, at that early on that was really doing it in real time and doing it in a digital way. Really um, groundbreaking stuff in that way and things that actually later on, you know, I mean, I, I, I sat in workshops in the year 2001 with people trying to figure out how to do that with Maximus P on their laptops now. Um, it's, it's something that people still want to do. I sit in workshops, people in 2022 with Maximus P on their laptops trying to figure out how to do this now, so. Um, the last instrument of Kodonimi that we'll look at is, um, by the, these actually have been in chronological order. This was another one that Ralph Lundsten asked for. Um, and some background on both Kudunami and Lundsten was that they were, they were products of the 1960s and the 1970s culture. Uh, Lundsten was quite, um, quite a romantic gentleman. He was a, uh, a well-known composer of kind of what we would almost call new age music now, kind of very ethereal synthesizer music. Uh, when I go through his archives, there's one box that's nothing but letters from young women sending him photographs of themselves in various states of having different less clothes on, let's say, um, and professing their interest in him. Uh, he, was, he was quite a ladies man. Um, so he asked uh, Kudunami to make him something that he could use like, you know, for people touching each other, like at orgies or something, basically. And what, uh, what Kudunami uh, designed was something that was officially known as the Dimi S, but um, uh, Lunds then called it the Shalix Machine, which is love machine. And uh, Kudunami simply referred to it as the sex ophone. There were two of them made. Uh, one of them went to Ralph Lundsten. I think the other one was uh, uh, Kudunami kept in his office um, uh, for fun times uh, in Finland. And um, we're going to look at a little piece of a film, uh, Ralph of Hans uh, Lud from 1975, where he has, um, this is, by the way, Ralph Lundsten's house, which was his studio. The whole film is this voyage of these three young Swedish kids through this house of this magician who has all these strange instruments and they get to make all these strange sounds. And this is their encounter with the Shalix machine. I'm not going to translate the dialogue because you'll get the idea. Man kan faktiskt se det genom att klicka den på näsan och pussa sig kramat. Det är inte den. Äsch, jag känner mig helt och hållet med mig. Den här är så jättekul. Jättekul. <laughs> really cool. Alla måste hålla den här kula handen, annars så åker den ju hur. Så kan den här klicka ner på näsan. Mm. 
Foi uma antiga na sistema escolar. All right, then they go play some other crazy things after this. All right, cute overload. <laughs> this this to contrast with you know thinking of hippie orgies and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's it's basically kind of a digital sequencer synthesizer. Each contact advances it through different sort of steps and sequences. Um, there's another video where you can see uh, uh, Kudanimi as an older gentleman and Carl Michael and Hauswolf and the members of the Finnish band Pansonic all playing this together in a concert. And then you have these very old, serious Swedish Finnish guys poking each other's faces with these like serious looks and stuff. And it's yet another picture I could have shown you. Um, but this kind of touchable synthesizer is also something that's still very contemporary. It's a very current idea. I'm probably just about out of time and we haven't even gotten so many other things, but we've looked at some instruments. I'm gonna race through this last bit and try your patience just a little bit. We're not gonna dive deep, but what I wanted to talk a, a little bit was Kudanami, the futurologist. Um, one of the things that distinguished Kudanami was that you could almost have called, like in the 1970s, he became something we would re now recognize as a post-humanist. He had this idea that you could, if you, if you recorded enough information about your personality and your daily life, you could eventually upload yourself into a machine and be immortal. He imagined that he would come back in the year 2048 as a computer mainframe somewhere. His ultimate idea was that human beings would stop existing on earth because there wouldn't be any space anymore. And all of our consciousness would be uploaded into golf ball sized intergalactic vessels to float about in the drift and experience space or something. It doesn't actually sound like a lot of fun. And could enemy imagine that we would probably watch a lot of virtual porn as we floated around in these golf balls. One of the other things that distinguishes Kudanami was that he was very much also a product of the 1960s. And a huge part of his archive is private pornography that he made either of himself or himself with various partners. The other part of the archive are bus tickets and random things that he wrote when he was drunk on wine. So it would be a very interesting artificial construct of a human being that would be floating around in this golf ball in space. Um, a very interesting take on what a human being is, let's say. Um, he had an idea that digital technology would replace physical art in some way, that anytime you had code that could realize a piece of art, you could make a physical instance of it anywhere you wanted. Or perhaps you could just have some paint on the wall that simply showed you that thing. Um, that's a pretty current idea. Um, he had ideas about where art was going, like how the computer was gonna change art. Um, writing in 1982, he already saw that the word processor would replace the typewriter. He imagined that in music, algorithms would replace com composition entirely, that we would simply write a line of code that would be a composition, and that we could endlessly iterate on different ideas of that line of code to make a composition instead of writing every single note. That's a pretty current contemporary idea. He had the idea that visual arts, an object could be encoded in three dimensions rather than actually physically constructed in the first place. Then you could reproduce it anytime you wanted. That's a pretty current idea. And finally, um, wow, another copy pasta. Um, computer music on the bottom should say dance. The idea that you could put some sensors on the joints of a dancer and you could record all those movements and then you would have a reproducible and editable piece of choreography that then you could render with either another real human being or with a virtual construct, which is also something that they do in the lab across the street. Um, later on, like in this kind of computerfication of ideas, um, one of the ideas that I like a lot is this idea of anti-perceptual art, art made by a computer for other computers. We have a lot of technology right now that's about one computer looking at an image that another computer might have made and trying to figure out what that image is made of. So he just thought, okay, this is just going to be another genre of art. Computers are going to look at other computer art. And maybe the computers are going to start thinking their own thoughts and they're going to have an experience that actually has nothing to do with human beings anymore. That's pretty far out. Um, finally, um, and I, this is the part that I believe in in, this, in the strongest way, that actually um, storage medium becomes the physicality 
of an artwork. The rest of it is that it's infinitely reproducible and it's also infinitely editable. Uh, we stop actually having this idea that we need to make an original artwork all the time. And instead we realize that actually art has always been about this idea of importing other things into our concept and modifying them and changing them and making a new version of it. I don't think that that's special to the digital era at all. I think this is the way art has functioned throughout history. And we've had this little kind of spike in this idea that one person alone with a paintbrush in their studio is somehow reinventing history. But that's an anomaly. That's an anomaly in the history of art. And I think that the way the digital art progresses will kind of bring us back to this idea that it's, it's ideas that transmit through people with the use of machines, some kind of technology, whether it's a paintbrush or a computer. Um, the last thing that I think he was writing about that I found really prescient was this idea of a personal communicator. Writing in 1986, he had the idea of kind of the system of baffles you could put on your head that might block out your sight and replace it with other things or transform the things you were seeing or transform the things that you were hearing or that some sort of sensors would give you some sort of kinesthetic approach towards controlling what you were seeing and hearing and interacting with it. Um, so all, in all these things, he's kind of anticipated the use of mobile phones, he's anticipated the use of virtual reality, he's anticipated the use of machine learning algorithms and all these sorts of things. I'm not saying that he was psychic, I'm not saying he was any sort of um, Nostradamus or anything like that, but rather that he was aware of developments and he could see potentials of where they were going, and he just happened to be really good at thinking about what might happen with them. So the closing experiment. Um, uh, Kurenemi wrote in 1971, do you want to be a model for Picasso? We've trained a machine that can reproduce any era of Picasso you like, whatever kind of pose you want, um, any sort of, uh, you know, do you, do you, we could also predict what, what Picasso might have. Hi. <laughs> we can we, we could even predict what Picasso might have painted if he hadn't died. I'm, I'm already being um, I'm already being bootlegged and I'm about to be um, transformed into something else and projected through eternity on the internet. Um, so anyway, uh, 1971, he, he thought, well, okay, we'll just train a machine and then we'll just make an infinite number of Picassos. Um, there are lots of tools to do that right now. One of them is an algorithm called uh, DALE, or um, the one that is uh, the one that you can find on the internet really easily was called for a while DALE Mini. It was kind of a free thing, and it was a text prompt artificial intelligence where you could simply say, uh, I want, like, what, what does the machine think this looks like? I happen to like metal music a lot, and I got really into this thing of saying, like, I want um, death metal album covers painted in the style of Picasso. I want a grindcore record with a cover done by Francis Bacon, things like that. And I would get these amazing, you know, mashups of things. This works for two reasons. One is the style of Pablo Picasso is very well known to the machine. And the other is that through internet searches, what a death metal album cover looks like is also a fairly rich source of data for this algorithm. So actually, I would use almost any of these for my next record without doubt. I love them. They're great. I've got a huge collection of these in all sorts of genres, all sorts of painter styles. What happens when I ask this same algorithm to paint me a portrait of the famous Finnish synthesizer designer named Erke Kurenemi in the style of Pablo Picasso? We get something like this. Um, synthesizer is a very rich source of information. Obviously, Pablo Picasso is a very rich source of information. However, the pictures that represent Erke Kurenemi are probably from somebody's LinkedIn website with the na same name, and it's completely a different human being. But I still like them. They're kind of awkward. They're kind of weird. Um, and this shows that um, there was some utopian idea that was back in whatever, 1971. And we're pretty damn close to it. Um, but the utopian idea is already forgotten who Erke Kurenemi is. So. I thank you all for your kind attention to the noise that I've generated here this evening. And if you have any other questions, let me know. Thanks a lot. Sorry, it was a bit long. Yeah, sure. Uh, 
media about media projects for the future and how uh, other media in the past have kind of like tried to think about how future will look like in the and stuff like what do you think about media and like films for example that have kind of predicted stuff that actually did happen like uh, uh, i don't know play perhaps for example and the way which which thing in the Blade Runner? I mean, or or, or did you figure out that I'm a replicant? It's uh, out of the bag. <laughs> I, I think they had drones, you know, but back in the day we didn't, and now we use okay. them ubiquitously. Okay. So maybe something like that, like the drones like that, that actually kind of stick around. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that it's hard to. I don't think that it's hard to kind of gaze into the crystal ball and imagine things that will happen in the future. Um, and part of that, I think, is because the kinds of things that we want technology to do remain consistent, even when the technology changes. That's one of the tricks that makes future prediction a lot easier, is that human, human nature, human desires and fears and hopes are um, remarkably similar over the years, over the generations. I think perhaps hopes and fears are actually really yeah, it's not um, it's not a polarity. It's a spectrum, yeah. as we I think we mentioned a little bit earlier. Yeah. I I have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you for the very informative, historical uh, uh, overview of the work. Uh, my question is more like, for example, we got through like uh, two dynamics um, work, and a, and a little bit like on other like uh, scenes or like uh, fiction design uh, approaches and also I've seen your workshop a little bit like these few days and they're all very interesting but like what uh, I would like to know more is about like what like or, like what do you do in in terms of like this practice or like for example how do you apply this knowledge in your practice and like in your like own machines because I know that you do like your own synthesizers or like you try to kind of redesign and um, like or for example like uh, if I'm not mistaken in your research in your PhD research like you go through archives for example and um, you got through a lot today and in order to redesign so like what is this process for you and like how how do you think you apply this knowledge or how do you develop this knowledge or like uh, how do you step one uh, step one step further from what's already been done from your case study yeah yeah that's a really good question and in fact that's that's the million dollar thesis question right there is how do you engage with this stuff without simply reproducing it? Because I'm not, I will, of course, reproduce some of these synthesizers um, and dramatic. Um, I'll never really be able to play that machine unless I make my own copy of it. And of course, I'll make my own copy of it. But that's not the point of the research that I'm doing is to simply make another thing that was already made in 1968 or something like that. Um, the point of my research is to figure out what those instruments meant at the time and what we can bring out of what it meant at the time and how much of that still applies to us now. The end result of some of the instruments that I make that are based on something that could have been made, for example, might look and function radically differently. Um, it's, it's more to find out what, what desires have stayed the same and what desires have changed. Um, and maybe the thing that I would try to keep the closest to um, would be some of these other ideas, rather than to worry about how the instrument was made and how it functioned exactly, but rather to think about what were the what were the modes of mediation? How how did how did the user and the instrument relate to each other? And what was the goal of that instrument? The goals of the instruments, as Telius, might be the most important one actually, because you can realize those in any sort of number of ways. Um, and we still keep realizing things according to some of the goals of the instruments from Kudanami that I showed now. We still want some of those things. We want to be able to dance in front of a camera and make music. We want to be able to touch each other's bodies and make sound. We want to be able to create these really complex compositions and be able to manipulate them and move them around and change them and things like that. None of those goals have changed at all. So it's very, it's very easy to think about other instruments that would address some of those things. 
then, like, then, for example, like, um, you refer to these kind of two intentions, like uh, other people were mentioning as well, like fear and hope. So mm -hmm. then, how, like, where is your position within that spectrum? Like, or like, how do you think that by doing this research, you, you also like uh, kind of delve into this a bit also? Luckily, no, I, I was going to say most music tends to deal with hope or most music instruments tend to deal with hope, but actually I'm a big fan of, of metal music and noise music, which actually very actively engages you in confronting things that you find repulsive and things that make you fearful and things that bring up these strong, um, wow, another Greek word, cathartic reactions, right? So um, yeah, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm on both sides as, as far as an artist. I think you can inspire both things. And I think you can inspire both things in equal measures. And, um, and that neither one of them, by inspiring either one of those feelings, I don't think you, 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 you're doing anybody any harm by bringing up either things, reminding them that they do have hopes and they do have fears. In the design of music instruments, um, one of my colleagues at, um, at, at, the, at the, the Technological Institute that I work at, uh, he teaches a pure data programming course. And one of his exercises is make a stupid bad instrument. Make, a, make an instrument with horrible interaction. Make an instrument that's so frustrating that people just don't want to play it and, and optimize for that. Optimize to make it really stupid and really dumb and really ugly and really frustrating. Um, and even in the workshop today, I was kind of trying to optimize frustration a little bit when you were all testing your ideas on each other, because I was trying to really limit the format that you were testing the ideas to get to some certain ends. Um, and I, I think you can do that. I, 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 th I think you, you, can, you can work in that territory as well. Um, not everything has to be sunshine and flowers. You can, um, one of the examples that I gave in the workshop was that you know, you, you wouldn't go watch a two and a half hour movie if they told you the entire story and gave you the punchline to the jokes and everything like that in the first two minutes. The rest of it would just be super boring. You have to pull people along, pull them through a narrative. And um, certainly to get that catharsis, you need to take them someplace kind of wicked, right? Uh, horror movies don't work unless you take somebody to someplace really awful. And then the end of it is either uh, the bad guy wins and you come out feeling really gutted or the good guys win, and then you come out feeling like you won with them or something, but you've already, you know, you've gotten that catharsis. Narrative theory is also really important. So that was a really roundabout way of answering your question. The other thing I can say is I don't entirely know yet. That's what the next parts of the research are, is how do I, how do I take these ideas and make objects with them? Thank you. But I <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. No, it's fine. I'm just coming closer so I can hear you today. So, yeah, the synthesizer and the AI and the instrument analysis is on the wrong side. Um, what it really is going to be is um, just kind of, um, it's about the possibility that I just have to do. I was very familiar with that. Yeah. So, well, I, I found it when I was searching for how to write it, coding knowledge. And I saw it by a program coming in and started generating uh, a lot of And I really like the idea because uh, when you listen to a certain music written by a human, it has some emotions and things like that. Yeah. But when I listen to that, Metal music, it's quite neutral, and I thought there's not all that much of my emotions. So uh, I sort of listen to that because I don't know why I don't get any position in it. But then I started thinking about when I am writing a lyric to that music, there are both the thoughts come from. 
they, there's, there's bottles of wine and fish to eat someplace else. And um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.